The OSG Sports app is up and running on your Android or iPhone. Install the OSG Sports app and listen to our podcast from college football, soccer, and lacrosse. What are you waiting for? Get the OSG Sports app today. What makes college football special? It's the rivalries and trophy games. From the Cold Bowl to the Old Brass Spittoon, it's college football's rivalries and trophy games with your hosts, Anthony Goldman and John Wilkerson. Tommy Palmer, thanks. We appreciate you listening to our rivalries and trophy game podcast on whatever podcatcher you're listening to, whether it's our host site speaker or Spotify or Stitcher Radio, iTunes. Uh, we, we're glad you're tuning in. Uh, today, we've got a lot of rivalries to talk about. South Alabama and Troy are playing as we speak, as we're recording this podcast. Phil Canner talked to J.B. Byers, the voice of the Jaguars. In Division Two, we've got the Chili Bowl between Eastern New Mexico and Western New Mexico. And Frank Tristan, the head coach of Western New Mexico, joins John Nelson. John also has Mark Lewandowski, the voice of St. John's, in Minnesota as it's the annual Holy Grail of the Johnny and Tommy game between St. John's and St. Thomas. And we've also got uh, many more rivalries to talk about. And joining me is Anthony Goldman. Anthony, how you been? Oh, doing good, man. You you know, it's uh, the third Saturday in October, John. It's chill. It's in the air. It's getting crisp autumn weather outside. And uh, it feels like football. Yes, and since you are decided we're going to talk about the third Saturday in October here in the A Block. We're also going to talk about Oregon and Washington. Let's start with the third Saturday in October uh, between Alabama and Tennessee. Anthony, when is this rivalry going to matter again? I mean, this was a huge SEC traditional type rivalry up until, I guess, uh, when Nick Saban took over. Well, the thing I love about this podcast is when we do this rivalry and trophy game shows, we get to reminisce a little bit and we get to, you know, romanticize about these games and what they mean to us as fans. We don't have to necessarily talk about what's going to happen on Saturday because we know what's going to happen on Saturday. So <laughs> let's ignore this weekend's game and let's romanticize about it. Um, this is a game that as a kid was just as big as the Iron Bowl to me. Um, you know, at the time growing up, LSU was not the LSU that we've got to know over the last 20, 25 years. And it was Alabama and it was Tennessee. Um, My first football memory, and I, you know, I can remember bits and phases here. I actually went to a game uh, before then, but my first thing I really remember vividly about Alabama football was 1993 and the 1717 tie. And that was David Palmer. Tennessee was looking to beat Alabama. I forget how long the win streak was. I believe it was maybe seven or eight games at the time. Um, but Alabama, just a little bit of history, had they were on a winning streak. Some of those wins, Alabama were underdogs, sometimes by more than two touchdowns, and had still beaten Tennessee. So Tennessee was leading Alabama. It was in Birmingham, and this was a big moment. This is going to be the moment Phil Fulmer had taken over. They were going to get their chance to upset the tide. And David Palmer came in and ran a way-before-its-time version of the Wildcat, John, and uh, scored the touchdown at the end of the game on a sweep. And that tied the game. And that's the only time I can remember a tie feeling like a win in college football. And uh, this game means a lot to a lot of people in the state of Alabama still. Yeah, and... You know, really, I guess when you think about this this rivalry, this goes back to the the General Nealon days and the Frank Thomas days uh, for each school. I mean, when you talk about the old school SEC rivalry, this is kind of the uh, probably the top of the pecking order, wouldn't you say, of that uh, of that rivalry? Well, this rivalry has the history as far as the last 100 years plus of the game. It's got the history that you would associate with Ohio State and Michigan. You know, it's never had the hatred or the passion. Um, Alabama and Auburn has that, but Alabama and Auburn don't have the championships. I mean, these are two of the winningest programs in conference history and, you know, in national history for that matter. Um, It's still a big game to a lot of people, too, which – I think is a testament to how special it is and how much fans cherish rivalries because this game hasn't really been in doubt at all 
since 2008, I would say, since Phil right. Fulmer was gone. Now, there's been some close games. You had the game in 2015. You know, that was a close one down in Tuscaloosa. You had, of course, the Mount Cody field goal block. But on paper, we always go into these games the last decade plus knowing who's going to win. But for the example, this weekend, my brother and his wife, every year they come over to my house, neither one of them are football fans. My, my uh, sister-in-law is actually from Denver. So I don't even know if she had seen football until she met us. And my brother, he he doesn't really care at all. But every year they come over to watch one game, and it's this game. Not the LSU game or not the Auburn game. So this game still has a lot of history to it, and it's respect. It's a respectful rivalry between the two schools. It is respectful, but it does have its moments, uh, especially with – with Phil Fulmer and, and, and some of the things that he did, um, you know, I think about the Albert Means thing, uh, you know, back in the early 2000s. And, you know, oh, yeah. that pointed a lot of hatred by Alabama fans to Phil Fulmer. Uh, and so that really kind of um, upped the ante a little bit in this rivalry. The two teams still respect each other, but there's been those moments. Oh, it's definitely had its, you know, the 90s were probably that time, John, where the hatred got going the most. Yeah. Um, up before Phil Fulmer, you know, Bill Bill Battle played at Alabama, you know, mm-hmm. was at Tennessee. I mean, there was a lot of crossover between Alabama and Tennessee. Phil Fulmer kind of got it going, but the 90s had that moment. Um, I think if you wanted to look at where this rivalry got ugly, you could go to Gene Stallings first year. So 1990, Alabama goes to Knoxville. Tennessee's ranked fifth in the country, and they're undefeated. Alabama, at the time, had a losing record. They were 17-point-plus dogs going in the game. And there are – I actually have the pictures. You can't see the video. I have pictures that – I forgot where I got them, but they're from the Tuscaloosa News. And they're of the Alabama buses driving up to Knoxville from Tuscaloosa. And there are people hanging off interstates when they hit the Tennessee state line – with signs that said, go to hell, Alabama. And they're lined up on each exit all the way from the state line to Knoxville. So I, I think if – and Alabama, by the way, won that game. They won 9-6. to six. It was 6-6. Six to six. Tennessee was kicking a field goal under a minute left. Alabama blocks it, recovers it 20 yards deeper. Then they kick a field goal, and they make it and win. So I think that kind of kicked it off. And then with the former stuff – it just kind of got going from there. So it has gotten – it's been heated at times. But now it's respectful. And most Alabama fans, look, they want Tennessee to be good. I would say out of all of Alabama's main rivals, this is the only one that Bama fans would say, I want Tennessee to be good because I want this game to mean something. This also is the only rivalry I know of that basically kind of violates a, sec- a NCAA violation uh, with the victory cigars. Yeah, the victory cigars. And you know what? It's a tradition that uh, unofficially is still celebrated. And it's a tradition that my entire family takes place in, women included, just so you know that. (laughs) Yeah, well, true Alabama fan right there. Let's transition from uh, the third Saturday in October to uh, another uh, border war. One that uh, you and I really appreciate. I hope uh, there's people out there across the nation that kind of appreciate it as well because it's kind of tucked in the Pacific Northwest, and that's Oregon and Washington. And they face off uh, this week, this Saturday in uh, Seattle. And this has a lot of – it's got some some juice to it, especially since Chris Peterson took over at Washington because Oregon really has – dominated this series uh since 2004 and then chris peterson shows up and you know they get a few wins in 16 and 17 oregon wins in overtime last last year this is a cool border war that not a whole lot of people know about well and you talk about you know heated this rivalry to me is the definition of heated um i this i mean honestly is my favorite rivalry in the pac-12 And it's not an in-state battle. It doesn't have the history of USC and UCLA. It's not Arizona, Arizona State, all these great games, Apple Cup, blah, blah, blah. But this game, to me, is my favorite because these schools loathe each other. Yep. They do not like each other. 
And there has been some nasty moments with fan bases, sometimes involving fans on the field, fans getting into it with cheerleaders on the sidelines. It's gotten ugly. But, um, you know, no one's ever been hurt, so it is what it is. This is an ugly game. And the thing about this game, it's a game of streaks. You know, you mentioned before Chris Peterson got there, Oregon had been on that streak since 04. Before then, Washington had been on a streak. I think Don James only lost four times to Oregon. I, I mean, they dominated during his whole tenure. So, what, you know, this has been a streaky type of series. And uh, it's good to see both teams ranked and there be a little meaning to this game because this is a game that even when Oregon was in the doldrums in the early 90s and Washington was going through their spells in the mid-2000s, this game still meant a lot. Well, from 74 till 93, Oregon won three times. And, and then they started turning the tide a little bit after that. Uh, the, the streak from 2004, you mentioned the 2015 11-year streak where Oregon just dominated uh, the Huskies uh, before um, they broke the streak in Eugene, with putting up 70 on the Ducks uh, in 16. Uh, you talking about breaking a streak. That's the way to break a streak. No kidding. You know, I, I was doing some research on this rivalry, and one of the things that stood out for me was uh, a Oregon running back that was tackled by a fan – uh, they <laughs> kind of denied uh, Oregon a uh, a uh, top ten win. So, uh, but this rivalry has everything, and should be a good game this week. Yeah, this rivalry has everything, even um, dog droppings being thrown at defenseless cheerleaders. <laughs> so that's all I'm going to say about that. You can research that one on your own. But this, it literally does have everything in this rivalry, well, and but- this will be a good game. I mean, this is. This is not the biggest national game in the Pac-12, but yeah. I think for I think this is the most passionate game of the weekend, without a doubt, in the Pac-12 because it is a game that matters as far as rankings as well. Both these teams, this is a big game for the North. I mean, this will be a separation game for the North. And Oregon, ever since that game against Auburn, no one's really watched them on a national scale, John, but guess what? They have gotten better and better each week, week in and week out, and and they are rolling right now. And for Washington, this is Chris Peterson's chance to kind of show that they have not taken a drop off since last year and losing all that talent. Well, we've got many more rivalries to talk about in this trophy game and rivalry show. But before we do that, we know you want to get tickets to some of these rivalry games. And Anthony, where are you going to go to get tickets? Oh, if you want to go to the third Saturday in October, John, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to go to SeatGiant.com. And when you go to SeatGiant.com, there's going to be a promo code, John, there. And what it, what do you type into that promo code spot, John? Three letters. S-D-H. And why, why would you do that, John? Because it helps you and it helps us. That's SeatGiant.com. Right. While we're recording this, South Alabama and Troy are playing... For the Battle of the Belt, Phil Kanner talked to J- J.D. De- Byers, the voice of the South Alabama Jaguars. We're going to play it anyway. It was a good interview. That's next when we come back. Find this and past shows by downloading the OSG Sports app on your mobile device. Enjoy all of our shows from the OSG Sports Podcasting Network. The OSG Sports app is up and running. Download it today. The battle of the belt between South Alabama and Troy was played Wednesday night. And in this one, well, it's Troy that claims the belt. 37-13 over South Alabama. Caleb Barker and Kalen Geiger combined for a couple of touchdowns in the win. Now, earlier in the week... Phil Canner interviewed the voice of the South Alabama Jaguars, J.D. Byers. Here's a portion of that interview. The series between the two schools, South Alabama and Troy, started in 2012, but it became a trophy game in 2015, didn't it? Yeah, uh, it was kind of, um, you know, thought up by the two school student government associations. The SGAs got together and you know, through this area of the South, uh, it's commonly called the Bible Belt, and 
you know, the, they just kind of came up with, what, what if we had a championship belt that looked like a large, gaudy wrestling belt, and the guys <laughs> fought for it? And that's what we have. What's it like on campus this week? Is it a game that the students talk a lot about, or the players talk a lot about it in the locker room as they're practicing leading up to it? Yeah, and you know, uh, as far as students, they're, they're going to pack on several, probably five tour buses that will take up there full of kids, you know, they'll get their Beat Troy t-shirt, and uh, they'll talk about it all week, and uh, we'll feed them on the bus, take care of them, get them back safely. Now, as far as these uh, players, and, and we had the uh, coaches' noon luncheon every Monday, and we just left that not long ago, uh, uh, earlier in the week, and we were talking with Trey Minter, and he's just a good example of both rosters. Is Trey made an early comment. He's a senior, uh, and he said, hey, very first offer out of high school was from Troy. Well, Trey Minter plays for us. Uh, there's a lot of guys. Yeah, we got a guy off, you know, right out of their backyard uh, on our team uh, who is from uh, right there uh, at Charles Henderson High School. That's right across the street from Troy's campus. And of course, they got a ton of kids out of our backyard. But that's pretty common. We're we're a much larger metropolitan recruiting ground. So a lot of these guys know each other from high school. They either played against each other or they played with each other. And some even went to junior college together. And so the you know the it runs kind of deep as far as this rivalry when they meet up. A little national love for this game. It is, and I think it's more than just the the fact that it is a rivalry game. I think some of it has to do with that belt uh, they liked <laughs> last year. In fact, and, and Chris Cotter is going to do the play by play for the second straight year. He and Rocky Boyman did a very interesting uh, open last year when they acted like they were Mean Gene Okerlund and Randy Savage back in the day doing a <laughs> interview with the belt in tow. Uh, so we'll see what they do. Creative coming into this one, uh, prime time, seven o'clock tick on ESPN two Wednesday night. Awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Um, JD, thank you for joining us here on the rivalry and trophy game show. Uh, we appreciate your time. Um, this show, the show may actually air before the game's over, but the insight on the rivalry was tremendous. Thank you, sir. Have a great week. And, guys, I'm going to toss it back to you in the studio. Thank you, Phil. When we come back, we go Division Two in a couple of directional schools from New Mexico playing for the Chili Bowl. John Nelson has Frank Tristan, the head coach of Western New Mexico, next. You're listening to College Football's Rivalries and Trophy Game Show. Hey, what's going on, y'all? This is Rock at the What's Up Falcons podcast, and I'm joined with my boys. My boys in the house, where you at? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what's up, what up? Oh, gee, and we have Q, and we have Hoop in the house. Q's here, <laughs> yeah, the most beloved yeah. guy in all of sports entertainment. Indeed. Hey, y'all, we want to thank everyone for listening to us, and if you want to listen to some great Falcons information, check us out on the What's Up Falcons podcast. Right, fellas? Right. Sure. Hey, we here every week, baby. We're keeping it real, so check us out out there on twitter holla peace peace subscribe to the what's up falcons podcast on itunes and soundcloud listen to the what's up falcons podcast at what's up falcons.com Welcome back to the OSG on CFB. It is trophy games and rivalries this go-round. Our next stop, Western New Mexico University and the Mustangs as they are getting ready for their rivalry game against Eastern New Mexico. And it is the Chili Bowl in Division Two in the Lone Star Conference. Hanging out with us is the head football coach of the Mustangs, first-year coach Frank Tristan. Coach, thanks for hanging out with us. First and foremost, with your history in the NAIA at a place like Segu, what attracted you to the job? <laughs> That's a good question. Um, really, I um, everybody said that Western couldn't really compete in the Lone Star Conference, um, and uh, they they I felt like there was a, a spot, and this was a good location um, because you know we're close to Tucson and Phoenix, and I'm I just just confident in our guys enough to think that we could. So it was attractive. Um, a lot of people when we were at Sagu, they couldn't. Uh, you could win with a bunch of little Christian boys that wanted to be preachers. <laughs> and so, um, you know, that was kind of the thing that uh, just trying to prove people wrong and and um, give give kids an opportunity to, to compete and play football. And there are kids from all around the country. I mean, in our uh, footprint here in the southeast, there's even some kids from Georgia, one from Alexander High, one from Bradwell Institute. So uh, you've got kids from all around the country coming to play for you. Yeah, you know, you get... 
two types of kids, I think, is you get the one that's just, you know, doesn't have the height or the speed to get to the DV, Division One level, and they are just hungry to play football. Um, and then you get the one that was, you know, for whatever circumstances, didn't get the break and, and who's super athletic but kind of has that chip on his shoulder. Um, and, and then with our location, we get kids from all over the place, um, all different nationalities. It's kind of a melting pot of guys. Um, but what you, you find is, is kids from all over. You got to try to get them to gel together uh, and uh, with different different reasons why they play. Um, and they're all sacrificing something. They're paying something. Um, so they're, they're more bought in, I think. And there's even, if my math is right, four players from American Samoa. That has to be some interesting challenges for you. No, and <laughs> that is a challenge. I mean, there's so many different cultural things from just the way, you know, the kids from Texas are, yes, sir, yes, sir. And then, you know, other kids are like, yes, coach, yes, coach. I mean, you just got little different things like that. Um, but, you know, one of the things that, that we've done that I think has worked and it's accelerated the process for chemistry um, and I know this sounds cliche, but like love doesn't have a specific language or culture when you really love a kid. And, you know, I, when I first got the job in, in, uh, end of March, I said, listen, I just adopted you into my family and, you know, I might not know the same cultural stuff that you do, but, uh, man, I'm going to love you like you're my own son. And so I think that kind of bridges the gap. And then, I mean, it takes time for kids to really say, oh, is this guy serious? Like, does he really do that? You know? Um, but um, I, th I think that's really helped us, and it's, it's, like I said, bridged the gap a little bit. Obviously, the season's been tough for you. What's the, the season been like? Yeah, it's, it's, been, it's been tough. We've had some off-the-field things with uh, we lost a member of our, our team, uh, and, and then we just had some family members that have passed away. So it has been, it's been one of those years of, that I just think growth. I mean, we've grown together, um, and then also just growth on the field, um, just our competitiveness. Uh, if you look at our our scores from last year compared to this year, um, there's there's some difference, and uh, you know it's a process. Uh, you know, a lot of changing a program just doesn't happen overnight or just because you want it to. Um, but the kids have really bought in, and I really have seen growth. And um, you know, the win against UTPB was great for our guys. Um, and then we really we were in the game last week too, and and really kind of shot ourselves in the foot. Um, so it's one of those, it's just growing and sometimes there's, it's painful, but uh, it's definitely a season of growth and I'm really proud of our guys. And I know on uh, one aspect of it, uh, when, when you have someone that you lose like Eddie, who, who is a freshman and you, you have that kind of adversity that you're having to deal with uh, off the top, what, what's his, what has it been like and what did uh, Eddie mean to the program? Yeah, it's been a challenge, and I think the hardest thing was that, like you said, he's a freshman. So some of our seniors, man, they didn't really know him very well. Um, but but some of our freshmen that came in with him and had a history, they knew him in high school. Um, and then, you know, that they really all of a sudden got close to him. So guys at completely different levels of grieving and dealing with it, I think that's been the biggest challenge. Um, I do think it's brought our team closer together and in and, and chemistry, but – um, you know, here's a great example. We were in the middle of practice and I've just got my arm around a kid and we're just talking and they're running drills. And my defensive line that I'm coaching is just by themselves because, man, this kid needs me. You know, he just needs and, and tears are running down his face. But at the end of the day, that's going to be a little bit more important than, you know, if we're working our spill technique, <laughs> you know. Uh, so it, it, that's, been the, that's been the challenge. And you really don't know when it's going to hit a young man. Uh, you just have to be available all the time. Um, and so that's been one of those things there, you know, just kind of keeping things in perspective and being available. And I know that these guys, you know, playing in memory of uh, freshman Eddie Cruz from uh, Eastwood, uh, El Paso Eastwood, they're going into a rivalry game. How can you explain or how do you explain this rivalry with Eastern New Mexico? Yeah, and you know, the the thing with, with our program is a lot, of, a lot of the guys are new. And so we're needing to educate them a little bit. Uh, on a rivalry. Um, a lot of them just don't know because we turned over the roster a little bit and, you know, just the nature of the beast is we haven't won the game in, in 14 tries. So it's not like it's been back and forth. Um, so this is one of those things where we're saying, hey, let's renew it. And by bringing, you know, we want to try to bring this competitive spirit back to it. Um, and what kind of, especially for our seniors that have you know, they didn't choose to be part of this transition. You know, they didn't sign up for that when they came to Western. 
So, you know, hoping for them to leave a mark on, on their time here at Western that says, hey, we won that, that rivalry game. This is something that we can put our stamp on. Um, and so, you know, presenting it to them that way and, and cause we've got a great bunch of seniors that are just great men. Uh, and so you want them to have that opportunity and see what's at stake. And obviously in a first year with a first year staff, how are you and the staff looking at it this week? Uh, biggest thing for us is not trying to do too much because sometimes you try to do something real special and, uh, cause the guys are going to be hyped up. And then obviously you can throw the athletic um, differences out the window sometimes because kids will play above their potential um, in something like this and and emotions will be high so like I said before if, if you try to put install too much this week then you got kids that you know they don't want to have to think while their adrenaline's going uh, it's got to be instinct so you know, kind of limit the game plan a little bit and do what we do and do it really fast and do it really well. All right. From your perspective and the Mustang perspective, go ahead. What's the, the game preview as you're, as you're looking at your guys getting ready for Eastern here in the Chili Bowl? Well, our, um, for, for us, we've got we've got two seniors on defense that are just really good playing well. Um, number two, James Lee, is, um, is, is a defensive end for us and has been playing lights out, and he's a hometown kid that redshirted. Uh, and and now he's really become a force, and uh, I'm so proud of him. And um, and then Roosevelt Calhoun, another senior, that that is. And then we have two uh, players on offense that came this year. Um, number two, Reggie Colson. He's one of the top leaders in receiving uh, this year for the Lone Star Conference. And then obviously our quarterback, uh, C.J. Fowler. Uh, those guys have have really been special, and they put in some work. And uh, they're special athletes. They're all got a different story. All, all have uh, different backgrounds. Completely different people. Um, but it's cool. They're they're representing Western and they're doing it well and they're playing at a high level. And then my last question for you: What does Western New Mexico University football mean to Silver City, New Mexico? <laughs> That's a good question. You know, um, football is one of those things where we have. It, it's not like you know, coming from the Dallas Metroplex, football is everything. The stadium is huge. You know. Um, football here is just kind of a toughness thing. It's not some glamorous that I'm, uh, you know, that maybe kids were in the in the uh, Texas area in some high schools. They really look at it as a glamorous thing. This is more of um, tough guy, hard nosed football, and and it's kind of our community. You know, Silver City is, a, you know, now they're they're mine copper and um, kind of that blue collar type thing, and uh, that's kind of what it is. Uh, even the high schools around here don't have huge numbers. But the kids that are here, they're tough, and they've got a toughness about them. A lot of them are going to play both ways. Um, and so I think our college has a little bit of that DNA in it, too, where these guys are, are tough kids. They, they might not have the, the highest vertical, best 40, but they're tough, and they're not afraid to keep playing. Uh, that's really been a trademark of our team that I've seen, you know, when you don't win that many ball games, but your guys are still fighting in the fourth quarter. Um, that's kind of a... It's kind of it's so commendable on their part, and it's it's fun to watch because you got kids that kind of the Rocky Balboa, <laughs> um, kind of that personality of dude, is this guy human? Why is he still hitting me like this? Um, and that's one of the things we pride ourselves on. And you know, our, our training room is full of guys that are banged up and bruised up, but they'll they'll keep firing. Coach Frank Tristan, head coach of the Western New Mexico University Mustangs. Thanks for coming on with us. Thanks for being a part of the OSG on CFB and good luck this weekend. You bet. Thanks. Thanks, John. When we come back, rivalries and trophy games continue. It's the OSG on CFB. The OSG Sports Radio Network will be right back in two and two. The OSG app is up and running on your Android or iPhone. Install the OSG app and listen to our podcast from college football, soccer, and lacrosse. What are you waiting for? Download the OSG app today. Welcome back to the OSG on CFB, the Trophy Games and Rivalry Show, and it's time to go into NCAA Division Three. It's Johnny's and Tommy's this week in Minnesota, hanging out with us, the play-by-play voice, longtime play-by-play voice of St. John's University, Mark Lewandowski from uh, AM660, The Bear, WBHR Radio, hanging out with us. Mark, thanks for being a part of the show. All right, Mark, full disclosure, one of my favorite books is Austin Murphy's The Sweet Season, that he spent that one season there with the guys from St. John's University, one of my favorite books, and it has always been one of the things that has attracted me 
to St. John's. And when it comes to, to Johnny's and Tommy's, this one is a big deal. Yeah, it is. It's uh, two top 25 teams. The winner of the game has the inside track for the conference championship. But more than that, because St. Thomas is going to be moving to Division One in two years, this year, next year, in the MIAC, and then maybe the Pioneer Conference or go compete with North Dakota State in the Gateway, uh, it's even more special because it's a, a, a long-standing rivalry that dates back to the early 1900s that will not be anymore, most likely. And for a guy like me, obviously, I would go ahead and say that if you have a bucket list when it comes to college football, Collegeville should be on it. Right. And you want to come in October because the way the Natural Bowl or Clement Stadium is set up, they used to call it the Natural Bowl because they didn't have it named. And what it is is basically it's in a bowl uh, with uh, trees surrounding well, I would say three quarters of it. You know, you've got the press box sitting there, which is rather large. But my view across the way is woods. And so in October, with the leaves turning and fall setting in in Minnesota, like last week against Bethel, it's just an amazing foliage and a great place for college football. It's like a college football field sprung up in the middle of the woods. And there's no more interesting or picturesque view, probably, at least in Division Three. Now, there are some others that, that, that you can claim a little bit better, but uh, it's a joy to coach there, and it's a, or a coach that's announced there and coach there for our coaches. But it's a special case. It, it really is. They, uh, you know, John Gallardi was there so long, and, and the coaching staff has been unchanged for probably about a decade now for the most part since Gary Boschen came in. and um, He was on the coaching staff, and he's continued a lot of traditions and, you know, they do a tailgate. It's very open and welcoming. And yeah, if you've got a bucket list of games or places you want to go watch a game, like Collegeville should probably be on it. This year, and in the past, if, if memory serves, the game has been played at the Metrodome. The game has been played at Target Field. This year, it's at Allianz. Yes, Allianz is our soccer stadium in Minnesota for the Loons, Minnesota United. And it's the first time that it's going to be staged here. The reason being is because St. Thomas's facility you can get 10,000 people in there, but it's tight and it's uncomfortable for a lot of people, tough to see. We're going to have 20,000, roughly, at Allianz Field for this game. Uh, I think two years ago, 36,000 at Target Field. And to be honest with you, and you can go back and look at the footage, it's 75 80% St. John's. Uh, we, we bring in a lot more fans than St. Thomas does. Now, here's a question for you. What does football, and this is for folks who haven't had the chance to, to see Division Three football or see St. John's or Johnny's and Tommy's, anything like that, what does football mean to St. John's and to the state of Minnesota? That's a great question. Um, it, it's Well, to borrow a phrase from John Gallardi, it, it's ordinary guys doing ordinary things exceptionally well. These are kids who are going to be doctors, lawyers, um, school teachers who are getting an education at a liberal arts division three university that have got to experience uh, a true sense of community that dates back to the 1800s because St. John's is you know, a, a fairly old institution, not as old as some, but uh, just the same. But it, it, it's well-rounded. Uh, there's a lot of community and service that goes on. Uh, the, the athletic department is a big uh, Basically, charity event that they do, uh, you know, kids fighting hunger, uh, I believe is what it's called. And they, they package food for different, uh, under, under impoverished or impoverished areas and things like that. Um, they, they're big involved with St. Jude's. Uh, they do some fundraising for St. Jude's. We just had a tackle cancer day on Saturday uh, where we raised money for that. Last year we raised 21000 I don't think we hit that this year. Um, but St. John's football is, when you think of small college football in Minnesota, they're probably at the top of the list because of the four national championships and John Gallardi. What's your best John Gallardi memory? And it can be a Mount Rushmore of memories if you want. Um, you know, that's a great, uh, my best John Gallardi memory. Um, we, yeah, well, for Division Three, definitely. And, and, and even for all of coaching college football, to do it as long as he did and have the success he had, um, you know, just an amazing 
And, and, and I guess, you know, I didn't play for him. I'm not a Johnny, but I've been here 20 years, and so I've, I've been adopted by the alumni, which is a great feeling. And I guess the, the sense that John and John, not Coach, John, is winning with nose, uh, if you get a look at that, it's an amazing list of things. You know, no tackling in practice, no whistles, cheerleaders, things like that. But the fact that um, when he passed away, um, and, and we played St. Thomas the week after he passed away, and to see the great crowd and the tributes to John and the way the team played, I mean, they did you know, ordinary things exceptionally well that way, that day in beating St. Thomas 40 to 20, their big rival. I mean, that was huge. But uh, just the way that, you know, guys talk about how things on them um, that they carry to this day. They, you know, the lessons they were taught about competing and about how you treat people, uh, that's probably the best uh, that has come out of, you know, John Delarty and his effect on St. John's football players. Um, you know, we had a post game that we don't, John really didn't like the media. He didn't like talking and answering questions. But one time we did pin him down after a game, a uh, playoff game at Central of Iowa. And we got a great interview with him for about five minutes about the game. And that's, that's one of our better memories because usually he likes to have his assistant coaches, you know, take the helm and, and, and the kids. Let's just see the kids get the attention. All right, time for the game preview of Johnny's and Tommy's. From your perspective, what do you see as this game comes up on us on the weekend? Well, we're undefeated, and you know, five and zero, four and zero in the conference. St. Thomas is undefeated in the conference, and they are four and one overall. Um, we have the Gallardi Trophy winning quarterback back, uh, Jackson Erdman, who had an exceptional year last year, set the school record for touchdown passes in a single season the school record for touchdown passes in a career, and the conference record are both his, and he built on that weekly. So he is going to have to play very well against a very aggressive St. Thomas defense that blitz on pretty much nearly every down. When they don't blitz, it's almost news-breaking. Um, St. Thomas, they're exceptional defensively. They're a power football team. We have embraced the five-wide concept. We love to throw the football. We run it as well, but... Um, we are more wide open. It'll be interesting in the fact that there's going to be new turf down on the field at Allianz Field. They are bringing in new turf because, believe it or not, they're going to have a playoff game, an MLS playoff game, Sunday, the day after week. Yeah, yeah they're going to tear that. We're going to tear that field up, and then they're going to play a, a, a soccer playoff game on it, which I find to be incredible. But the contracts are signed, and so they're going to make some money on this game. and. There's no sense to move it, really. But it'll come down to whether St. John's can can put points on the board. I, I, the defense is coming off a shutout of Bethel, who is averaging 39 points per game. So I, I feel the defense is routed in the form after losing two all-conference and one all-American. Actually, two all-American guys and three all-conference performers last year. But um, Jackson is going to be working with uh, a wide receiver core where we had returned one of the top six pass catchers from last year. That kid blew out his knee last week against Bethel, so he's done for the year. So now it's really a, you know, it's a group of guys who have a total of five games of working with Jackson Erdman. The one advantage we have is our offensive line returns four or five starters from last year, and they're very good. And uh, they, they, a lot of pressure on those guys to keep Jackson upright in the pocket. All right, blatant promo time for those that want to pay attention to Johnny's and Tommy's this weekend, St. John's University football and athletics all season long. How do they do it? You can go to gojohnnies.com, and you want to go to the multimedia page, and they have a link to our broadcast. For home games, we do do a webcast. Uh, for away games, it's just the radio broadcast, and they can get that at gojohnnies.com. Ryan, click there, the SID is great about putting links to the game either in the preview or just from the football schedule page or, again, go to the multimedia page and you can click on it and listen live. Our free game show, it's like Division One practically. Uh, St. John's gets great support from area businesses. And so our free game show starts at, at 11.30, and this week the kickoff is at 1.10. Normally it's an 11.30 free game show. 
and the kickoff comes your way at one o'clock. And we do interviews with you know all the coaches, and we pick out a Johnny player, and of course we break down the matchup too. So and then we're off the air probably by next door. 440, 40, Mark Lewandowski, play-by-play voice of St. John's University, Division Three, getting ready for Johnny's and Tommy's this week at Allianz Field in Minneapolis. Mark, thanks for hanging out with us. Thanks for being a part of the show. Anytime. Uh, we'd love to talk to you guys again when the playoffs roll around. Because we hope- when we come back, it continues. The OSG on CSB Trophy Games and Rivalries with Wilkie, Phil, and all of us here at OSG Sports. We'll be right back in 2-2. Two and two. The OSG Sports app is up and running on your Android or iPhone. All you got to do, install the OSG Sports app and listen to our podcast from college football, soccer, lacrosse. Let's get this done. Get the OSG Sports app today. And welcome back. So, Anthony, let's kind of run down the rivalries one more time. Air Force and Hawaii play for the, um, I think it's the... uh, Cutter Trophy or the Cooter Trophy, K-U-T-E-R. Don't have a pronouncer yeah. here. Uh, that game will kick off at midnight, our time, in the Eastern Time Zone. I tend to like Hawaii in this one. Yeah, I think going to the island is always tough. And uh, Hawaii is one of those schools that they play for a lot of trophies. And I don't think that Hawaii really has like that team that they hate. But Hawaii loves to win trophies. They, they like to just load up a trophy case. So this game is going to mean something to them. I think they get this trophy. I'm picking Hawaii, too. All right. Oregon and Washington. Love the quarterback matchup on this one. Who do you like? The quarterback matchup is fun and intriguing, but the running game matchup is lopsided, and that's why i got to go with Oregon. They're running the ball so well. Their defensive line is also playing really good. I think that they're going to make Washington one-dimensional, and I think Jake Eason is going to throw multiple picks. I agree with you. I like Oregon in this game. The running game will dominate. We both like Alabama on the third Saturday in October. And Division Two. we heard from John Nelson with Frank Tristan, the head coach of Western New Mexico, as they face Eastern New Mexico in the Chili Bowl. I'm going to go with Western in this one. I, I'm going to ride with you. I'm going to go with Western in this one as well. And the Johnny and Tommy game. We heard from Mark Lewandowski, the voice of St. John. Go with the Johnny. I always go with the Johnnies. I, I'm, I'm a St. John's guy, John. I told you before, when I lived in Minnesota, this was a big game, and you know, when you live in Alabama, you gotta pick Alabama or Auburn. When you live in Minnesota and you go north of Minneapolis, you gotta pick Johnnies or Tommies, and um, I'm gonna stick with what I picked when I was 10 years old. Alright, so we're in agreement there. So, a uh, abbreviated list of uh, rivalries and trophy games this week. We appreciate uh, all of our guests. Uh, so, for Phil Canner. John Nelson and Anthony Goldman. I'm John Wilkerson. Enjoy the games, everyone. So long. You can find this and past shows by downloading the OSG Sports app on your mobile device. Enjoy all of our shows from the OSG Sports Podcasting Network. The OSG Sports app is up and running. Download it today.